All right. Yeah. 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 D- tell me the audio's working. Please, God, tell me I've got the audio correct for once in my entire life. As the, as the Texans pull off something that, ah, like this is, this is the kind of crap that Daryl Morey pulled time and again. I'm not going to compare this to the James Harden trade, obviously. That was a whole different scenario. Um, but just by being active and being available and being ready to pounce when a team like the Bills has been dealing with A, cap issues, B, <laughs> as one Buffalo writer called it, a thousand microaggressions by Stefan Diggs over the past year or so where he's trying to angle his way out of town that you end up getting uh you end up getting a trade for a receiver who can completely transform what this team is and i don't like i don't care where Stefan Diggs is in comparison to his prime or what have you things were weird in buffalo this year i know people in buffalo in 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 some respects and we'll listen to some of them here in a minute um are 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 fine with Stefan Diggs leaving because of all of the circumstances. Uh, this just this complements and completes a wide receiver room, which which mind you, still does have guys like Noah Brown also. You know who are who are plenty productive with Nico Collins and Tank Dell. But but this gives you a top three that is going to just completely unlock C.J. Stroud and might also transform the way the Texans look as an offense. I think Sean McVay, when he went to the Rams, yeah, a lot of people expected that he was going to just run the 49ers offense or a Kyle Shanahan offense, but he had three really good wide receivers and he only had one good tight end. So what did he do? It became a more three wide receiver pass happy uh, offense than, than what Kyle Shanahan does. It just, it just think it blows things wide the hell open. So the very, very first, the very first, thought I had of this immediately was like, I don't know, man. Like D'Amico's all about no energy vampires. This works out to be basically the Texans trading an equivalent of a late second or early third round pick for Stefan Diggs and the right to pay his contract. We'll get into that in a little bit, but on paper so far, I'm a okay with this. As far as the energy vampire part of it, and Stefan Diggs, who's now twice angled his way out of uh, a team, both in Minnesota and then in Buffalo. I'm not worried about that. For uh, And I see one of you already made this point that I was making this morning. What I've been saying, you load your locker room with leaders so you can make this trade for guys who, who might not check off all the boxes in terms of guys that you want to be your locker room guy. Guys, that's why you have all the leaders. That's why you take guys who are team captains. You want to have such a culture that – and, and you want to have such a quarterback that can handle guys who sometimes have a, a need for attention. That's one one thing that Stefan Diggs teammates have said about him in the past. It's like, ah, sometimes Stefan just needs a little attention. And then after that, he's going to be fine. So that, look, that is a big question is exactly how does the personality fit? I'm not really worried about this at this moment because let's remember those first couple of years in Buffalo, Josh Allen and and Stefan Diggs were best buds. They loved each other. It was going to be a brotherhood that would last forever. I'm sure they still like each other. It's just that circumstances in Buffalo changed. Um, when Nick Casario got here, a lot of us wondered, all right, how much of the Patriots way is he going to try to bring in here? And, and we were skeptical about that, especially with everything going on with Jack Easterby and everything else at the moment. I think that... I think I think most of you would agree with me that some things have been like the Patriots, but some things Nick has done have been completely different than what the Patriots would do. One thing that the Patriots have always done that I've admired, at least that Belichick always did that I admired, was he would take on guys who might not be the perfect mold of personality or what have you. And then he would see what they have. And if it worked, awesome. And if not, then we say bye-bye. This this is that scenario, and I don't want to compare this to Randy Moss or anything else like that. Like Stefan Diggs is Stefan Diggs. That's all he needs to be right this moment. He doesn't. We don't need to compare it to any other via you know trades or what have you. But in terms of bringing in a guy where the previous place just wanted to get rid of him for cap reasons and also just because he'd worn out his welcome, um, that you bring him in here and basically you're tied to him for a year. 
the guaranteed money is just a, a $3 million after this season. I'm sure they're going to restructure the salary a little bit or, or do something where the Texans now have, according to Texans cap, I believe it's $11 million in cap space. They'll be able to expand that back up and, and be able to work. But man, this is exactly... This is exactly the kind of bold and ballsy move that you do when you create all that extra cap space that they that they created last Friday. It seems like forever ago because we we kept waiting for okay, what's the next move? What's the next move? Next, what's the next move? We thought maybe it would be a Derek Brown trade, or I'm even blanking on any of the other trades right now. This just man, when it comes to people that have. Uh, you know, and a lot of this is coming from Buffalo. I've been I've been spending the last hour kind of looking. I talked to a couple of people I know in Buffalo just to to get their pulse on the situation. And I've seen people say like, "Well, you know, it's not going to be such a honeymoon when when Stefan is yelling at CJ on the sideline about not getting the uh, not getting enough touches." I think there are a couple a couple things here. One, when Josh Allen was hooked up with Stefan Diggs, that was when Josh Allen was at a point in his career where. Yes, they had. Uh, yes, they had made the playoffs. The Texans beat him, beat them in the playoffs. But Josh Allen was just simply not looked at as a huge smashing success just yet. So Josh Allen very much relied upon and needed Stephon Diggs, and Stephon Diggs was on his best behavior. Um, but I also think it's important to note the difference between, like, let's say C.J. Stroud versus a young Eli Manning. Remember, remember with Eli Manning and Shockey was just constantly demanding the ball. And it turned out over the course of a few years that, wow, it looked like when, man, when Shockey was injured, Eli actually looked a lot better. And they ended up deporting or getting, getting exporting, getting rid of uh, Shockey. Uh, and, and, and in some ways it made Eli Manning better. CJ Stroud is not Eli Manning, like in terms of maturity, in terms of leadership, in terms of ability to set a hard line, all that stuff. I'm not like, I am not worried about that in the slightest. So it, in terms of any concerns about Stefan Diggs and either his personality fit or anything like that, I think it's going to be just fine. And if it's not, then it's, this is a minimal risk. I, I mean, the, I kind of, like I had to keep checking to see, I had to kept, I, like check to see and be sure that the Texans still had both their second round picks. I thought it was going to be a misprint. And honestly, I still will. I'll read this. I'll read the terms of the trade to you because I'm going to have to keep doing this just to be sure that I don't screw it up because this is that you picked him up. You picked, I don't care who you draft in the second or third round this year at receiver. There's just zero guarantee whatsoever that you're going to get the kind of play that you're going to get out of Stefan Diggs, especially when paired with Tank Dell and Nico Collins. So, the Bills receive a 2025 second round pick, which was acquired from the Minnesota Vikings in a March deal. Y'all remember that. Uh, well, the Texans will also land a sixth round selection and a fifth round pick next year. In a deal that stands as one of the most significant moves of the offseason, this is from Mike Middlehurst Schwartz of USA Today. Two aspiring contenders shifted their outlooks for both the near and the long term. The Texans now have a go-to receiver for Stroud, the reigning NFL Offensive Rookie of the Year, who this season became the youngest quarterback ever to win a playoff game with his team's victory over the Cleveland Browns. I was there in the wild card round. Diggs, 30, has had at least 100 catches in five of the last six seasons while eclipsing the 1,000-yard mark in each of those years with top target Nico Collins returning and promising second-year pass catcher Tank Dell, oh, and promising second-year pass catcher Tank Dell, working his way back from a fractured fibula, fibula. I saw that. The Texans have flipped one of the league's most questionable receiving core before last season into one of its most talented groups. Very important to remember, and thank you for remembering that, Michael Middlehurst Schwartz, is we have all these jackasses acting like everybody, like everybody knew that CJ was going into a perfect situation. And that Bryce Young was the one who was going to have hardships. My ass. So I I got excited when I found out about the compensation. I I got excited when I started thinking about like some of the some of the counter arguments in my own mind were all right, Ed Reed. Okay, Ed Reed was not the same player at the stage of his career that we traded for Ed Reed um, as Stefan Diggs is right now. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll reject that comparison. I also do think that. Stefan Diggs is very much stepping into a better situation than Ed Reed was at the time. Uh, and, and I think part of that is that, look, man, Ed Reed was looked at as the guy that's going to finally push the Texans over the edge into, into actual genuine contender status. Um, 
I do think that that's how we're going to start looking at this with Stefan Diggs, very much so. But the circumstances are just different. And and the, the quarterback situation is certainly different than it was with that 2013 Houston Texans team. So that part I feel good about. Um, as far as like some of these microaggressions I talked about that Bills fans will cite or that Tim Graham, the writer, cited, I mean, some of this was just simply certain things on social media, you know, uh, Steph, Steph, Stephon Diggs' brother, Trayvon, d- d- hinting about how he should get up out of there. Uh, Stephon Diggs blowing up on the sidelines at times. The one thing that I know, just because as I was kind of, you know, voyeuristically listening in on Buffalo radio after Buffalo was eliminated from the playoffs, there were a couple times towards the end of the year when Stephon Diggs had a drop. Well, in that Chiefs game, there was a very specific moment where Stephon Diggs dropped a very catchable ball. and turned around and as he was walking back towards Josh Allen went like this, like, like, yeah, the pass was a little bit off. And like, that was it. I, these guys lost their, they, they, they flipped their bleep um, when that happened. I'm not worried about that. Cause again, that's something that happens in like year three or four or after things fade away. Like the bills are paying a boatload of money. They're actually taking a net cap hit of $3 million because they've got $30 million in dead cap money that they're going to have to pay on this um, just to to show him the door. And the Texans are not going to have to deal with that. The Texans, it, this is a one-year deal or a one-year scenario where they're tied to Stefan Diggs. So I, I feel freaking awesome about this. And I, I did not expect to. When I first thought that I wasn't going to like it, a lot of it had to do with the compensation. And and I'm just not worried about it whatsoever at all. Let me read a couple of comments and then we'll get to uh, listening in on Buffalo, perhaps. Um, sour grapes. Buffalo wouldn't have been in the playoffs without Diggs. Buffalo's lost Texans game. Yeah. And, and, you know, Patty, I think at least part of it is just different timing on the franchises. I think, yeah, I, I, I've seen some people try to frame this as Minnesota emphatically winning the trade where they ended up drafting Jamar Chase after they sent off Stefan Diggs to Buffalo. I don't know if it needs to be that emphatic a victory uh, that, you know, basically, what did I say? Jamar Chase, uh, Justin Jefferson, sorry. Um, Victory, victory uh, over my brain right there. So I I think that the Bills got a lot out of Stefan Diggs. Like Stefan Diggs helped legitimize Josh Allen. And I think that is one of the differences here. Remember, like we talked about just like five minutes ago, Stevon Diggs legitimized Josh Allen, whereas CJ's already been legitimized. You know, remember, we saw Josh Allen in that playoff game versus the Texans. I, I mean, he was lucky that it, he was, the, the, the Texans had to play their asses off to win that game, but Josh Allen was also lucky to not actually blow it single handedly by that stupid lateral that he tried. Like, he was still a very raw and immature quarterback at that time. He made some changes to his throwing motion, but he also got Stefan Diggs and that. That changed everything completely. And like right now, though, they they shot their shot. They had their quarterback on their rookie contract, just like the Texans do now. And and it didn't work out. So I think it just things have gotten ugly up there in Buffalo. It is not I don't even blame like the fans for I don't blame the Buffalo fans whatsoever for like basically saying like, all right, fine. We got to reset anyway. So Stefan Diggs is not the guy for that situation. I, I agree. I think that's that's probably where the two sides can meet in the middle. It's like, it's, it's just, it was a bad situation. Stefan Diggs is not particularly like situations like that. He finds himself in a new situation. Air raid. Uh, do you play in the NFL? I saw you on NFL 2K5. Yeah, I did play in the NFL. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Darnell. Sorry. I don't know why that, uh, that, that caught me off guard a little bit. I don't like to think of myself as somebody who played in the NFL. I like to think of myself as YouTuber extraordinaire. Uh, I liked you. I like what you've been saying on the radio. And you've got as many leaders on the teams as the Texans do. You can afford to bring in the occasional knucklehead or diva. Yes. Keep reminding me of that because I've been making that point and I wasn't speaking specifically about Stefan Diggs, but I do very much 100% believe that. And that's why, look, in the, in the Belichickian Patriots of yore, one of the reasons that they could bring guys that like, didn't seem like they fit the Patriots way was because they had such a strong culture. I remember talking to one of their players, Kyle, Kyle Brady, uh, who spent the last couple of his years of his career there. Um, and I was there for the perfect season, perfect regular season. Uh, you know, he talked about how like deflate gate, no spy gate was such a non distraction because the leadership was so strong on that team. I don't know. 
I don't know if the veteran leadership is quite at that level of that young Patriots team uh, right now, but I, I think they're on their way there. I think CJ goes a long way towards that. I think that there's enough kind of like positivity that's just in the DNA of those guys, of some of the young leaders on that team, certainly of D'Amico Ryans. And I think with Casario and his ability to withstand, you know, the situation like the Steven Nelson thing last year. So Steven Nelson, Steven Nelson goes off without naming Nick Casario, but, you know, makes fun of Nick Casario on social media. Nick kind of just lets it slide, understands that these things happen. Steven Nelson comes in and ends up having a really good year for the Texans. Like that's, that's, and I don't know if seven, I don't know if Stephon Diggs has done anything nearly approaching that. You know, we like he flat out Stephen Nelson flat out just insulted the general manager. So like they've they've been able to withstand little blips in the radar like this and just kind of let bygones be bygones. So I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not worried about it. Let's see. I was on the uh, the 2005. I was on the year 2002 roster. 2002 through 2006. Okay, real quick. A 20 second aside, physical 100 on Netflix. It's a Korean reality show where these athletes, 100 athletes, vie through these obstacle courses and everything else to, uh, to become the last and final standing one. But uh, this is our new thing on the radio show. The, the Korean word for wow, as I become trilingual, is wah. And uh, so it's spelled U W A in English. So wah. And uh, that, that's that's my favorite thing to say now. My wife and I just randomly throughout the day will say, wah! I asked and I'm late, damn it. I know, I know, Gennaro. We're, we're here now. We're here for you. I'm extremely excited about this. I think that some of you, <laughs> wah! The trick is to not do it. Don't try to do it with an Asian accent because then you're just going to sound like a like a bigot at worst or at least an idiot at best. Uh, you just say say it with your... American accent, but wah! It's almost like that's that's an accent that that, that crosses cultural and ethnic boundaries, right there. You can uh, like you can yell out wah with nothing. Okay, excellent point, Gennaro. Just hope Lee Nico doesn't lose targets, or it, it raises an excellent question. As somebody pointed out that I follow on Twitter, I'll think of it as it as it comes to me. Oh, it was uh, John Crumpler pointed out. Uh, that uh, fantasy owners are going to hate this. Uh, fantasy, uh, this will be, this will, <laughs> two things are going to happen. I guarantee you right now, two things are going to happen. One, uh, people are going to be upset that Bobby Slowick still wants to run the ball. I will not be. The, the, when properly executed, the run game and the pass game in this scheme are integrally related. Like e the one relies on the other and there's nothing wrong with that. There's zero part of me that thinks that, oh, wow, because the Texans were more efficient passing the ball on first down, they, that that didn't have anything to do with the fact that they're also committed to running the ball on first down. I think this will help them get better at running the ball. I think Joe Mixon's going to be facing more light boxes than he would have otherwise. You know, he saw a bunch of them in Cincinnati. Um, but there's that. But then on the other side of it, too, there's uh, – there, there's You've got Dalton Schultz on the tight end side of things. You've got uh, Mixon and whichever other running backs. But then you've got three very, very viable wide receivers, not to mention whichever fourth and fifth guys mix in. So I think there's going to be days where you start Nico Collins and he only gets three receptions. And then I think there's going to be other days where you don't start Nico Collins and he gets 17 receptions. Uh, that might be stretching it a little bit. But I think it's going to be that kind of a situation, which can be all good. It's all about... It'll be horrible for your fantasy football team, but it'll be good for the W's and L's. Let's see. Like I said on Twitter, this offense is feeling a lot like 2004 Indy. This is the best wide receiving trio in the league. Let me bring that up a little bit. I'm going to uh, try to... You guys know how well it goes when I try to be my own producer on air, so just be gentle with me. But I do want to bring up a couple of the... A couple of my bookmarked tweets. Let me see. Enjoyed the stream. Great breakdown and analysis. Thank you. Uh, we'll also talk about Stefan and his production and how it waned over the second half of the season. I think that, for one, look, it, it was a weird year where Buffalo was in the top five in a lot of offensive categories, even as it was obvious that Ken Dorsey had to go and they had to try something different. Uh, and the, it just – it was a really – 
it was a really strange set of circumstances. I, I do think that you got to point out that Stefan Diggs' individual production doesn't tell the whole story there. He did allow a lot of others to feed based on him getting the lion's share of attention. And I'm not even saying that to make excuses or anything and act like he's going to get 1,700 yards this season or anything. I think it's that you should expect on a on a game-by-game -game basis, Stefan Diggs should be more lethal just because teams can't focus all of their attention on Stefan Diggs. Like there's there's going to be when healthy. There's a Nico Collins, there's a Stefan Diggs, there's a Tank Dell. All three of those dudes are sphincter tightening to defensive backs. Um, you know, in and, and Tank, it's with his speed. Nico, a lot of it's with his run after the catch, uh, which which gets even better now that you can spread the field out even more. And then and and then you can use Stefan Diggs all over the place. Like it's I, you know, I try to be pretty level-headed about this stuff. And if there's one thing I fear in football, it's winning the offseason. Cause man, a lot of times it is just a it's a shortcut to getting your teeth kicked in during the regular season. But uh, this, there's enough about the way that Nick has handled this that I actually feel, I feel pretty good being optimistic about moves like this. Like this is, uh, this is not mortgaging your future. This is not leveraging the farm or, you know, risking your retirement fund to bring in an aging guy like this. Um, I, I, I very much feel that and believe that. The other thing too, I think sometimes when it comes to guys who who might be perceived as difficult personalities, you got to kind of look at how do they affect other guys in the locker room? How do they affect team morale? I I might be wrong on this. We'll have some guys from Buffalo on the show tomorrow um, from the Buffalo media market. And I, I, I'm curious about this. I never got the sense that Stefan Diggs' disgruntlement was – filtering down to other guys on the team. I didn't feel like they didn't have buy-in or anything. I know there was that weird article written about Sean McDermott and, and his odd references to, to um, world history in 9-11. But other than that, I'm, I'm not overly concerned about that. All right, I'm going to bring up sports shock jock. Sean Let's see if we can do this. Oh, that's Stefan Diggs on a... Okay, here we go. <laughs> I didn't want to ask Sean to come on because he does... He carries my ass all day, uh, every day during the week. So let me know if you guys can hear this. This is Sean Pendergast with his four thoughts on this trade. Here is my getting into the truck to go home reaction to the Stefan Diggs trade that the Texans just executed. Stefan Diggs is a Houston Texan, the latest holy shit moment in what feels like a machine gun of holy shit moments over the last several weeks, really going back to that's poetry right there. The last year in the draft and hiring D'Amico Ryan, a, a machine gun fusillade of holy shit moments. This is an incredible, incredible day. Stefan Diggs is a Houston Texan. Um, I've got four thoughts on this great trade. Good job, Nick Casario. You got Stephon Diggs for what amounts to, if you do all the math with all the picks involved, basically you got him in a pick swap. Essentially, once all the Minnesota trade and this trade gets hashed out, the Texans move down from 23 to 42 and pick up Stephon Diggs. And in the process, pick up some extra day three draft capital the next two years as well. So just a great, great job uh, on the trade. Number two, what does this do for the Texans on the field? I think. Okay, so number one was simply the compensation. And honestly, that was that was my big thing. All right, Sean, I'm I'm tired of you trying to take all the just, just constantly. You just gotta have your face up for everything, okay? Sean, just a little a little Seth time, all right? Um, so yeah, the compensation was the big thing for me. I, I at the very beginning listen, Nick Nick apparently already apologized to Sean. Nick Casario, who who we have on at times when Nick wants to explain things. We have him on the show. We give him a very soft landing. And yet every freaking big deal gets announced like a half hour after our show is over. And I don't know if Nick is trying to make it look like he doesn't like us because he's afraid he, people are going to think we're too cozy or something. I don't care if people think we're too cozy with Nick. But today, this broke with one minute left in our show. And uh, Landry and Lopez, <laughs> bastards, they cut us off. They just cut us off.
they cut us right off, which was pretty, it was pretty funny. It was funny. Uh, but it left me to just sit and try to absorb everything. The compensation was what led me to initially say like, I don't know if I like this trade. And I, in my mind, I assumed, oh crap, they gave up a first or something for an aging wide receiver. Like we've said, we basically, we basically almost just, just did the opposite of the DeAndre Hopkins trade somehow. And when you find out that, you know, Sean was framing it in terms of if you go back to the Minnesota trade out of first of the first round, yeah, it does end up to be just like a pick swap. In terms of just the Texans trade with Buffalo, it amounts to like a second, late second round pick or an early third round pick to get Stefan Diggs with multiple years left on his deal, but really only a huge chunk of guarantees this year. So a very team-friendly situation. They're probably going to change it a little bit. The Texans have right now $11 million in cap space, so they'll probably tweak his contract. Um, and I, I would imagine Stefan Diggs is happy about this opportunity and this situation. I, you know, If he knows, I, I guess the one big question would be like, all right, realistically, does he realize where he is in his career? And it's really good to have some help. I think coming out of Buffalo, he probably understands that. Like trying to trying to bring Gabe Davis along for these last couple of years to be a running mate with him, which never really happened. I mean, they had to go out and draft a tight end really to get another threat. He's probably super cool with having many mouths to feed as long as it's all part of winning. And he doesn't have to do it in cold weather. So that's good. So that was point number one from Sean T. Pendergast. I think it makes them a Super Bowl contender if they weren't already. Whoa. All this firepower. Wait a minute. So just a great, great job. Uh, on the trade. Number All right, so this is number two. I haven't checked the Super Bowl odds. We haven't even talked about this yet. Number two, what does this do for the Texans on the field? I think it makes them a Super Bowl contender if they weren't already. All this firepower that they have, adding Joe Mixon and Stefan Diggs to Nico Collins and Tank Dell, and oh, by the way, uh, C.J. Stroud pulling the trigger. Are you kidding me? Uh, the rest of the AFC South and the AFC is on notice now with the Houston Texans. On notice! <laughs> for sure, training camp. Sorry if I yell, everybody. Camp is going to be a whole lot of fun. Number three. Okay, so Super Bowl contenders. Let me drink my drink here for a second. This is just water. <sighs> Super Bowl contenders. Yes? Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're Super Bowl contenders. Um, I think that, look... The offense, I, I like. I've been very adamant about this. I think you need to remember that last year's offense was not a genuinely good offense yet. There was, they were well on their way to getting there, and then Tank Dell got injured. But it was not a high-scoring, prolific offense yet. It was very obvious that they were close and could get there, but they're going to have to make some changes. We still have questions about left guard and center, um, but honestly, just simply the threat of these receivers balanced off with hopefully a better running back and um the, the like the other and cj stroud being a year older helps make the offensive line better um also cj stroud in having one extra year of experience and i think this off season as much as we're gonna deliberate and and dream about the passing game this off season i guarantee you cj if he hasn't done it already is diving into understanding the run game and understanding exactly how to check into the right place is one thing that one thing John Harris and I talked about this. I think there were some moments in case Keenum's game versus the Titans where in very specific moments, case may have been better down in the goal line because he checked them into the right situations uh, in the run game. And, and that's something like, that's not a slight against CJ at all. That's simply case Keenum having been around forever. And on some of those things, a veteran quarterback just knows and sees things a little bit differently. So I think this year the offensive line hopefully gets better, you know, individually as a, as a group. Each of those guys hopefully gets a little bit better, but especially at left guard and center. Um, but especially I think CJ's maturation, adding extra weapons is going to make them a look a lot better than, um, you know, just, just by virtue of not having as much pressure on them by the offense, having more options and by CJ, checking them into advantageous situations. So that's big. CJ can also become more of a leader now that he's got a year under him. So I've, yeah. And then defensively, you know, obviously they still have to figure cornerback out and I, it's not an ideal situation at defensive line, but I mean, for them to, for them to be a uh, less than average, it would be taking a step back. So I think at the very least, you've got a chance for a potent offense 
And I think you're going to have an above average defense. We'll see exactly where it goes with the secondary and everything. So yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to say that Sean is overreacting to that. I'm trying like hell not to be an excited homer about this. I'm trying like hell not to start drinking at, at two in the afternoon. But uh, yes, I approve so far of what Sean Pendergast is saying. Got to pump the brakes a little bit. The reason why Stefan Diggs was so inexpensive probably had to do with issues behind the scenes. I'm not that worried about that. I think you hire a coach like D'Amico Ryans and you import leadership and draft leaders to have people to lead. So I think Stefan Diggs, I, I'm optimistic that behind the scenes here um, that he'll fit in just fine. And there's plenty of leadership in that building to make sure there's no cancerous traits to Stefan Diggs in the locker room. My fourth thought on this is just... Okay, so we discussed that. If you're just joining the live stream, we've discussed that. My longstanding take has been that, yeah, if you're a team that brings in lots of guys who are team captains in college and you want those like blue collar, lunch pal, awesome dudes, guys like Will Anderson, especially, like that's like, that's the ideal football player right there. It's awesome to have those guys and you should try to get as many of those guys as possible. But like at a certain point, you got to think, all right, well, like who are these, who are these leaders actually leading? If you got a bunch of leaders in here in the NFL, ideally, you always have to have this balance where you've got enough leaders to offset the knuckleheads. And cause those knuckleheads can be so valuable. They can be so good. Oh my God. They're so good. They can be, they're just the best, man. This is why I know people get frustrated with Clowney and I just loved them because he was like, man, when sometimes when the Lord giveth, the Lord can't giveth everywhere. Sometimes when the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. So like with defensive linemen, the Lord giveth incredible physical skills, but sometimes he taketh on some of the judgment type of things. And that's fine as long as you've got a loving community around him, you know? And I do think that the Texans have built just between D'Amico, Will Anderson, CJ Stroud, um, some of the veteran players on the team. Like, I think they've got the right kinds of guys that can withstand and absorb sometimes uh, the more ornery family members. Like, uh, like sometimes Stefan Diggs gets to be. If you're a family, if you genuinely take on that family attitude, just like any family, you gotta, you've got a couple family members that act up at the cookout, you know, and that's just how it goes. You know, you don't bust up the family because of it. A little bit of nostalgia. This trade's getting compared to the locker room. My fourth. Okay, so this is Sean Pendergast's fourth point about this. Thought on this is just a little bit of nostalgia. This trade's getting compared in a lot of circles to the DeAndre Hopkins trade back in 2020 and that the Texans are now on the right end of it. They're stealing the guy from somebody else for next to nothing. Ironically, the day of the DeAndre Hopkins trade, you know who got traded from Minnesota to Buffalo in a much, much more enriching trade for the team trading him? Stephon Diggs got sent to Buffalo for a first-round pick and a whole lot more. Today, he's a Houston Texan. Circle of life, baby. Go Texans. <laughs> so that's Sean T. Pendergast. You should certainly follow him on Sports Radio 610 uh, or on Twitter formerly Twitter, x.com, and you should listen to him on Sports Radio 610 from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every day with Seth Seth C. Payne. Let's see. Uh, I know it'll be just depth pieces now, not really someone to impact the game like the last two drafts. I'm guessing, okay, let me ask you, Forever Royal, I'm guessing who, what you suggested. Did you suggest taking another receiver in the second round? I've Okay, this will be a fascinating one, too, is... This isn't frustrated. This is me thinking. This isn't me like but what I do with my kids sometimes. Um, what do you do? What do you do in this draft class where there's so many promising wide receivers? If you're sitting there, <laughs> if you're sitting there with one of your two second round picks, somebody double check that with me. I still I still can't believe that they still have the two second round picks this year. Um, that one of those wide receivers is available. Yeah, I think you gotta take them. I think you gotta take them no all right i'm gonna have to deliberate on this do you take whichever whichever guy i don't know maybe you're a ricky pearsall fella or something you'd get ricky pearsall to the point all right, i'm overthinking this i'm overthinking this hopefully it's not a hopefully it's a, a very clear-cut situation um tavandre sweat my dreams of a time you know what honestly if tavandre sweat and what if you got tavandre sweat and one of the sl uh, sleeker uh, d d defensive linemen, one of the defensive tackles that's a smaller guy. If I'd been thinking about taking a, I'd been thinking about taking like one defensive tackle and a wide receiver in the second round. I know it, like, it, it doesn't always 
work out this way. You know, it doesn't always work out so perfectly that the guys that you want in the positions that you'd really like are going to be there. Um, but if I were to look at a situation where when we get to, just want to be sure that I get this right. And we're going to listen to, we got to listen to Buffalo radio here in a minute. Um, because Buffalo, I like they, they've, I've listened to Buffalo radio a little bit as they discuss this stuff. And it's, uh, it's interesting. It's just, it's, it's interesting. Um, do, 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 consensus big boards. Lately, I've been going to a mock draft database just to get a feel for everybody's getting drafted. So like with defensive linemen right now, I saw there was a mock draft today. Field Yates has had Johnny Newton going to the Texans at 42, which would be a huge drop for Johnny Newton. And I really like Johnny Newton, but let's like, let's leave that to the side for now. Cause he's generally getting drafted, you know, in the, in the twenties or so, but let's say it was like Braden Fisk from Florida state. And then Tavondre sweat with the second pick in the second round. Would you guys be upset with that? Or would you say like, ah, oh, Nick, you've, you've collapsed. You've collapsed now just because of the pressure from former defensive lineman Seth Payne to take one guy who's a lighter, sleeker, athletic potential pass rusher and to take another guy who's a throwback to Ted Washington might end up playing heavier than Ted Washington. Would you be upset with that or would you be stoked beyond belief that they added like those? Because right now, there's nobody in the draft really. And like I would include Byron Murphy in this. There's nobody that really looks like that slam dunk. Okay, he's 305 pounds, but he's going to be an absolute menace versus the run and the pass. Um, you know, Byron Murphy is the guy who most likely to be that guy, but they're all a little bit undersized by modern standards. Like they're not these like 320 pound freaks of nature. If I were to take a Braden Fisk and a Tavandre Sweat, I feel like right then, man, D'Amico talks about the engine all the time. And and getting guys that can drive that engine, make the linebackers better, make the defensive backs better. I'd be all for that. I think that might actually happen. All right. Vest Casario always waits your, your radio show is over to make a move. I know. And it's a you know what it is though? It's embarrassing at this point. It's gotten to the point where it's hard, it's hard for me to look my wife in the eye after I get dunked on like that by by Landry and and freaking Lopez. Landry and Lopez get the juicy stuff to talk about. That's why I made sure to get this live stream on during their show. So thank you to all 496 of you that are choosing to listen to me right now. Don't tell my employer I said that. Uh, effing stoked. Yes, I like that spelling of uh, the, the F word. If Collins and Dell wouldn't have proven how good they are, then Diggs might be the one to mentor the younger players. Yeah, I think that, you know what? Um... I'm not exactly sure how to take that. I, I think, though, I will say, as much as kind of there's a, there's a lot of talk about Stefan Diggs and some of his outbursts and how there might be personality issues, this, that, the other thing, I do think that you, you also have to remember that there's a lot of positives about Stefan Diggs, the person, too. I think he's one of these guys who's he's got a lot of personality. He's got a lot of life in him. He's got a lot of energy. Um, he's got the appropriate amount of diva. I, I, like, a, I like the old, you know... Well, yeah, Andre Johnson is part, partly responsible for this. I feel like Andre Johnson and Kelvin Johnson ushered in an era of the uh, the egoless wide receiver. And that was good in a lot of respects. It was nice. It was nice to have even like DeAndre, who's got a lot of um, flair to him, you know, was still very blue collar. What did I used to call him? I used to call him blue collar Gucci, you know? Because there was that side of him that dressed up and was flamboyant and everything. But there was also that side of him that just, he just shut up and he went and he did his work. He was blue collar Gucci. I feel like Stefan Diggs is more just like old school diva where, yeah, every now and then he's going to, he's, he's going to ruffle some feathers and he's going to flare his own peacock feathers. And, and so be it. But my point that I was originally trying to get to Joseph is that, yeah, when it comes to route running, recognizing defenses and reading defenses and manipulating defensive backs, all that stuff. Yeah. Like veteran wide receivers, guys that make it a long time in the league. They're all like to a man. They're almost always way smarter than people realize they are because they just, they pick up on so many of the nuances of the game. And um, that's, that can help a lot. Like having guys in the room. Cause that really, you know, might've been what part of the idea of going after Keenan Allen too. Um, especially when it comes to Keenan Allen, the way he's been able to manipulate defensive backs. So I think that 
that defense, you know, that wide receiver room, other than Robert Woods, was still young in a lot of respects. Noah Brown's not an old guy, and he can be really good in that regard, I think. So I'm excited about that. Diggs will bring energy. Second is early for running back. Yeah, especially this year. This is a weird year for running backs, Frobius. You're right. I, I know you know that. Um, this might be – my God, my sideburns. Jeez. I'm in days kind of confused. Um, yeah, I think this is this is the year where there's no need to take a running back in the second round. It's uh, the running backs and quarterbacks are just moving in opposite directions. Every we talked about this this morning a little bit. Was that I, I the one of the problems with quarterbacks just getting drafted earlier and earlier, no matter how good they are. And there's so many quarterbacks now that get drafted in the first round that in previous generations would have been like third, fourth, or fifth round picks. It's the damn egos on them. Like, there's no real like, why on earth is Kenny Pickett allowed to have an ego? Because he got drafted in the first round. And you look at him, you're like, well, you shouldn't have gotten drafted in the first round. Stop acting like you're a first round talent. If you're a quarterback who gets drafted in the first round, you're you're no different than like any other position drafted in the third, fourth, or fifth round. If you're drafted like uh, anything outside the top 10. So stop trying to, the quarterbacks have become the damn divas, damn it. No need for a wide receiver at all. Uh, there really wasn't one to begin with. DT and safety are the only answer at 42 and 59. I disagree with you on the no receivers to begin with. I mean, there's like uh, to go back to this and I don't want to into like, uh, yes, I understand the draft is all a hundred percent crap shoot. So it's not like, um, you know, like when you talk about there being a lot of guys in the second round, it doesn't mean that all of them are going to work out. Um, but there are going to be guys that are, let's see if we were to look at just like, you know, Xavier Worthy, Lad McConkey, Keon Coleman, uh, Xavier Leggett, Ricky Pearsall, uh, Roman Wilson, just all these guys that are projected to probably go around the second round. Um, those are some those are some enticing names right there. But I, I do I do agree that right now there's not any need for it. So I'm not arguing with you. I just I do think that you are you're making a conscious choice potentially to pass up on some good future receivers, but you already like you've got your one young future receiver in tank Dell. You've got Nico Collins is probably going to have to get paid um, or will get paid unless he gets injured. If we let Noah Brown, I'd love to pick up Justin Simmons. I think he'd fit best for our schedule this coming year. I think with Justin Simmons too, you look at it for one. I talked about this last night on the Texans 22 podcast on YouTube. Good guys. I encourage you to go. It's Brown chubby bear and Leo. Uh, go check that out. But we talked about the Texans playing nickel as often as they do and, you know, trying to stop the run in nickel, trying to be better against tight ends. It's nice something that if you can have a three tight end or if you can have a three safety dime package, that goes a long way at times towards stopping tight ends and a lot of the other things that have that have messed the Texans up. Um, some of the stuff you could do against it, you know, like Indy's going to run a lot of RPO. Like they ran a lot of RPO with Gardner Minshew. That was one of the things that really screwed our linebackers up. The more safeties you have, and when you can swap a linebacker out for a safety sometimes, um, then by all means, yeah, I, 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 I'm I, good with Justin Simmons. Except, I mean, look, look, I think the move was made. The move the move that sucks up cap space was made. This was it. And we're going to, we're probably going to make do with draft picks for the most part and perhaps a couple journeymen on defense. We need a refrigerator now. That would be Tavondre Sweat, man. Oh, Tavondre. Tavondre Sweat. I I love I love 87% of what he does. There's 13% of it though that man, there's times in games where he's got a good down going, but when he goes to chase downfield a little bit or even to chase out towards the sidelines, there's times where he's just gassed. He's just flat out gassed, you know? And I got to I gotta go back and look at his snap counts in games because I don't think he's going to play more than 30 snaps a game in the NFL, sometimes 40. So they'll they'll manage it, but there are times where he just cannot get to where he wants to go. And, and he wouldn't be playing in the same kind of heat that he plays in at Texas, but he will be playing in heat at times. Uh, so that that's the only thing that scares me about it. But he would bring a run stuffing element and just kind of a badass lead pipe to the jaw element that that we don't really have on the the defensive line right now. DeAndre learned how to act on the field from Andre Johnson, great NFL role model. Andre tells some funny stories about when DeAndre was a young player. 
and <laughs> DeAndre would be in meetings and and just basically say, like, I don't. Why don't they just throw the ball? Just throw the ball up. Just throw the ball up. You know, like they do at Clemson. And and Andre would just say, Well, hold on there, young fella. We just there's a it's a way you got to go about these things. I do agree with DeAndre a little bit. Just a little bit. That was back when, like, all of a sudden, NFL coaches, after over a century of the forward pass being legal, just decided that, like, hey, this back shoulder thing, like, sometimes just letting a receiver go make a play on it might be a might be a pretty good thing. Let's see. Got to keep CJ out of the ice <laughs> tub. Kevin Hart and his tubs will give CJ a hammy cramp. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Dwayne is talking about, Kevin Hart's podcast in which he interviews people in cold while they sit in cold tubs, which I didn't know. I didn't know that this Kevin Hart gimmick was a thing. Uh, I call it obviously Kevin Hart successful without other gimmickry, but that's the gimmick on this podcast. He had CJ on and uh, CJ, CJ did some, had some good answers. Did that thing where he defends Houston like he does. Diggs will look good in the new unis. Yeah. Does Diggs, is there enough time for Diggs to make it onto the season tickets? I'm guessing yes. It's all digital now anyway, right? You guys don't get the physical tickets anymore. Remember when Hopkins fought the guy from the uh, Redskins at the time, the commanders now? Oh, uh, uh, dang it. Yeah, uh, shoot. This is embarrassing that I'm blanking on the defensive back's name. Yeah, you guys will fill it in. The top two wide receivers in this draft seem to have great personalities. If you're winning nothing, if you're winning, there's nothing for Diggs to complain about. You know what, Aaron? Yes, uh, 100%. And, and I do think that, look, this is something I fought for a long time. I, I used to fight this. And I remember having a conversation with Tim Crumry. So Tim Crumry, who was used to be a defensive tackle for the Bengals, he was a coach for the Bengals. He was the defensive line coach for the Bengals when I was a senior in college and working out for teams. So Tim Crumry came to work me out at Cornell. And, and back in the day, and I think it's still this way to a certain degree, like the Bengals are cheap. Like they're not as cheap as they used to be, but they're pretty cheap. So like they would – one of the ways that they would save money is they had a very minimal scouting staff and they would have their assistant coaches do a lot of the stuff scouts would normally do. So a lot of the workouts and everything, like they, the, the coaches would go do it. And so Tim Crummer, I came and it was just me at Cornell, you know, they weren't working on anybody else uh, that day. And although we did have Chad Levitt who got drafted, I'll do a separate podcast episode on Chad. Awesome. He was awesome. Awesome. Uh, anyway. So Tim Crummer, like a, Worked me out, and uh, and it was funny. Like he had me do drills and everything, and he loved me because I kind of like started getting into the drills. It's been a while since I'd actually played football, and he's blocking me like he's an offensive lineman. I ended up ripping his shirt off of him, so he ended up he ended up leaving. Uh, he had brought me a Bengals shirt, uh, you know, so he didn't have anything else to wear. He ended up leaving the facility wearing a Cornell shirt because I had ripped his shirt off, and he loved me because of it because like I beat the shit out of him in these drills, and I was really getting into it. Like I I, I kind of had this attitude like, well, fuck this, I'm just gonna go for it. I'm just gonna beat the shit out of this old man, and and he loved it. Um, but we got to talking after I'd beat him up and he was a badass. And, uh, you know, we were talking about guys that were character risks or guys that, you know, might not check off a lot of the personality boxes or what have you. And he said, look, you know, some people have the philosophy that like, it's not an issue. A guy being a front runner isn't an issue as long as you're in front, you know, like the guy that, the, like we love to say, like, yeah, I need foxhole guys. I need somebody who's gonna stick with me through thick and thin. Like, I, uh, that's how I used to be forever. Now I'm kind of like that. Eh, save that for you know your spouse. Find a spouse who's a foxhole person that'll stay with you through thick and thin. Because over the course of a sixty or seventy year marriage, there's gonna be some there's gonna be some some thin moments. You want a foxhole person there with you. If you got a guy on a short term deal, or in this case, you've got a guy that you've only got one year of guarantees, real guarantees to Stefan Diggs, then, oh no, he's a front runner. Oh no, he's only good when things are good. All right, well, then just be sure things are going well. You know, he doesn't have to be around for the reset year or what have you. I'm okay with it. I've, I have flipped completely around on that. I've just, I've stopped trying to be a hard ass about everything in my life. So finally, like, I finally realized like 10 years after, Tim Crumry, the guy who had his legs snapped in half in the was it in the Super Bowl in the playoffs one year and then came back to play after that. That that guy was old school enough to if he could have that attitude, then then I could have that attitude too. Let's see. CJ spreads the ball enough to feed everyone, which will stop the egos or diva stuff. Yeah, I don't I think too, you know, sometimes wide receivers 
some wide receivers are just flat out divas and they just get upset that they themselves aren't getting the ball. There's other wide receivers. And, and, you know, I think maybe Diggs falls into this category. They're cool if they're not getting the ball, as long as the ball is going to somebody appropriate. You know what this is? It's like, if you find out that your if you found out your girlfriend cheated on you and uh, you know, which is bad enough, but then to add insult to injury, she cheated on you with like the worst dude on earth. And, and and she got knocked up and then she and the guy left and you're like well uh, you just uh, you, you ruined both of our lives don't worry I'm not reliving past trauma here or anything you ruined both of our lives for this for that and uh that, that's how they feel they get very diva like because of it if uh if if the ball is going to an appropriate mate or somebody where you can feel like oh, all right it made sense all right okay good for her then 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 so be it Lost 20 viewers on that analogy. Uh, Lad McConkey would be a great fit. I, I love Lad McConkey. I would say also be careful in just comparing him to any random white slot receiver. I think Lad McConkey is much more than that. Unfortunately, the league has come around on this. Some of the assumptions they used to make. The problem with you used to be able to find inefficiencies with white defensive linemen and white wide receivers. As the, but as the league started to realize like, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe we should stop being such assholes to black quarterbacks. I feel like one of the, one of the, uh, one of the rebound or one of the, uh, accessory benefits to that was that they also realized like, oh, wow, maybe we should stop making a lot of race-based assumptions about positions on football teams. It's become less of a, it's become less of an inefficiency in the market. Like the, the Patriots were really good at capitalizing on, people making assumptions about various types of receivers or what have you for a long time. Everybody's caught up to that by now. And that's why America's in a good place. I don't, I don't watch the news. I just choose to assume that America's in a good place. Reliable wide receiver. <laughs> um, he said, I don't start shit. I finish them. Oh, that was DeAndre on hard knocks. Let's see. Uh, Javon Baker makes sense now. They're probably picking him up later in the second or third for the future. They brought him in for a visit. They brought in at least the guys on Texans 22 were telling me this. Um, this is where sometimes the draft Knicks and the bloggers and the YouTubers are really good at keeping up with this kind of stuff that's not put out there massively. The top 30 visits, they've had at least eight wide receivers in. And I wonder if maybe this, maybe what the most likely thing that happens is they end up taking a wide receiver in the third round. Like that one of these guys who's likely to slip the, that they feel good about because there's just so many wide receivers in this draft. Maybe that's what ends up happening. I'm, I'm totally not ruling out, yeah, Baker in the fourth. Yeah. San still the quarterback safety hybrid is what they need. That does, that does make sense. Now we wait for the draft. Yes. Uh, we need a tight end. Yeah. I think <laughs> thanks for writing in a caps. Uh, by the way, I don't the caps won't help you in general. Usually when there's a boatload of comments, I'm just gonna kind of go through and and hit it randomly. So I, I appreciate the effort, but uh the a solid young tight end will set up the uh, post Schultz. Yes, that's true. But this is the problem though, too. Outside of um the Georgian, there's uh, outside of Brock Bowers, there's not a ton of really good tight ends in this draft near the top. I think that's something where you're going to take a, if you take a tight end, it's likely to be in the mid rounds and, and maybe it works out, but it's not something you necessarily aggressively go after. That's just the way this, this year's draft is looking right now. Facts, the Lake team facts, and also D'Amico's personality on the team will keep digs in check. The Lake team, the Lake team. That's something I should know. Even if it's a misspelling, I should know. How much cap space is left? Right now, there is $11 million in cap space. So they can change that pretty quickly if they kind of just tweak Stefan Diggs' contract a little bit. One nice thing about this trade, for those of you who are just coming in, basically it works out to giving up like a late second rounder or early third rounder, depending you know, on everything shakes out. But very, very good compensation on the trade front. The bills are taking a boatload of dead money just to say goodbye to him. This year's this year is the only substantial guarantees on the contract. So, um, you know, they, there's some things they can do to tweak this to where it's still not going to hamstring the Texans on down the road, but they can create a little bit more cap space. But um, it's uh, it, it it makes a lot of sense. 
We got Stefan Diggs for free, except for the paying him part. But yes, uh, free from a draft standpoint, I think. We were talking about, yeah, oh, yeah, and for those of you who didn't realize, the second round pick is a 2025 second round pick. So they still have their, they still have their two picks um, from this year. All right. I want to do this. Let's do this, all right? Let's do something fun. Let's do this. You guys like fun? You like fun? Let's have some fun. That's my creepy guy. Uh, we've got Sean Pendergast. We're done with you, Sean. Thank you. I wanted to listen in on WGR 550. That's Buffalo's big sports station up there. And, um, and see about, let's see. Two, three, one, two, three, four, five. Where are you, WGR in Buffalo? That's not it. There we go. Let's see this. No, nope, that's not it either. Deepest apologies to all of you. So WGR, um, and I think Buffalo, like in Buffalo, I remember reading during the season that people were like just – really skeptical that people up in Buffalo um, were really skeptical that Stefan Diggs wouldn't be on the team this year. I think the reality of it kind of sinks in when you realize the cap situation they were in, that they have more issues than just like adding a complimentary piece to Stefan Diggs. I am really like, I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of digging in and figuring out exactly what all this means for Buffalo. Not that I'm hyper obsessed with Buffalo or anything. Um, God damn it. Excuse my language. I think WGR. It's an Odyssey station. There are sisters. There we go. Okay. So here's WGR explaining the uh, explaining it. Hopefully you guys listening to your favorite podcast. That's smart. Earning your degree online from Southern New Hampshire University. One to graduation. Between you and the game. That's why they make ordering for free delivery. No. With rugged. No. Good weave. Sir. So, whether you're Nordic shop online, Houston Texans, we do have the compensation. This is coming from Adam Schefter. The Bills will receive a 2025 second round pick via Minnesota, while the Texans they receive Stefan Diggs, a 2024 sixth round pick, and a 25 fifth round pick. Join the show as well, who's still somehow here. I had a meeting, he had a meeting. Jeremy White <laughs> of the morning show, conductor of the wide receiver train. How are you feeling? Yeah. Well, they're gonna get a receiver. Yeah we, yeah, we know they're getting a receiver now. I think the thing is though. Jeremy, when we look at this, I w- really quick in the break, we were all kind of talking like, are they getting a first round pick? What are they doing? Because what number is this? Is this pick via Minnesota. via Minnesota's second round pick? But even next then, year, it's twenty twenty five. It's not even this year. Yeah, okay, so this is where they're realizing. Okay, this was earlier when the bu- the Buffalo guys were just realizing exactly what the compensation was. Like, uh, was it a was it a first rounder next year? What is what is the compensation on this pick? This has got to be for Houston to take on the entire contract of digs so that the bills get out of this scot-free it has to be what it okay i just had this thought as we were coming back here what if this is somehow going to be a package for t higgins because now if houston eats all that cap you can realistically swing a trade for t higgins we're not but, and you could basically just it's not april fool's day it's it's not it's it is not. april 3rd I know. It, the Bills receiving room is Khalil Shakir and Curtis Samuel going to the draft. Going, yes, going into mm-hmm. the end of uh, April. That is their receiving oh, room. Oh, man. This sucks for these guys. <laughs> oh, jeez. What this tells me, though, is that the Bills love this wide receiver class. They have to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> they that, have to. Okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. At the very least, they can say, all right, we got. I because I think Bills fans Bills fans were sick of some of Stefan Diggs' antics, but they did also understand that man, we've got nobody. Which it, not surprising. Well, but, yeah, it, but, it's generational for I'm most potentially. Part. But I, my phone's dead. I'm trapped. I don't. I can't. I, I, can't, even, I can't even tweet about it. I got. I just. So I mean, like, but like, where right, do you go I'll let you guys me? go. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's real. It is. It, it is, is real. real. It is real. I, I was thinking it was fake, but no, it is in fact real. It is real. <laughs> Multiple different sources tweeting about it now. So. <laughs> Going to hear more from Jeremy tomorrow morning. But then, okay, so these guys, this was like in the infancy of it. This was right when I found out about it. Like, in in my first thought, okay, those guys were on the same page as me, where you're wondering, okay, well, we don't know what this means. What's the actual compensation? 
if the compensation makes sense, then by all means, sure, we that that's fine. But so we went in opposite directions from here. So the Buffalo guys are are assuming, all right, well, they got a first or something, right? Or maybe a, a, a second round pick this year, maybe the 42. Like if they're going to get a second round pick, can it be the 42 at least? No, you cannot get that. You can get next year's second round pick. Oh my gosh. At least it's Minnesota's. All right. Oh, you know what? I actually, that wasn't, that wasn't working any well anyway. I need something more updated from these guys. Um, tomorrow morning, but I mean, this is going to go. carry the rest of the day. I mean, this is, this is massive news. And I think Jeremy's right to bring it up though. Going into the end of April, April 25th is the start of the first round. The bills wide receiver room is Curtis Samuel. Yeah. Khalil Shakir, uh-huh. Justin Shorter, yeah. and Mac Hollins. Yeah. <laughs> That's your wide receiver room. All these poor bastards. I, you're going to, they have to move up though. Yes. Now. Like they, in my mind, I, we were just talking about it. Like if they move up, Diggs is your two, but they have to move up now yeah. because if your guy at 28 or even 20 doesn't hit, that's your wide receiver room. Yeah. I, 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 man, so, I'll, I'll tell you what, this is a cautionary tale of like how quickly it can all fall apart. <laughs> like you, the bills, man, the bills were right there on the brink of it. The bills, the bills were right there. If they had a good field goal kicker this year, they could have gone to the, they could have, they could have beaten the chiefs um, or at least you know, took it into overtime or something, man, that it just, it just, it fell apart and evaporated so quickly. This is why. And honestly, the bills right now, they're giving, they're taking a $30 million cap hit to say goodbye to Stefan Diggs. They did everything they could to maximize Josh Allen's rookie quarterback contract then Josh Allen got paid, and this year they had to say to, goodbye to a lot of people, plus plus Stefan Diggs. This is why I like I try to be super patient when it comes to not being overly aggressive during free agency. I think so far Nick has nailed it with the contracts he's given out. I think that you're preventing, and then with this Stefan Diggs trade, look, Diggs will be here for at least a year. The, the Texans have the ability to make it two, to make it three, to make it four, whatever it might be. Um, at some point, the history of Diggs has been that like he just gets a little antsy and wants to get the hell out when when things don't feel exactly right. A la Brandon Cooks, you know, Diggs might end up being Diggs might end up testing uh, Brandon Cooks and Eric Dickerson's record for most times traded by the time he's done with it all. But I don't care. That's none of my concern. The Texans are only on the hook for Stefan Diggs for one season in terms of guaranteed money. I should have explained that to you who were just joining us. So the, the, the lion's share of guaranteed money that the Texans will pay is this year for Stefan Diggs. Next year, after this year, there's like $3 million guaranteed. They might add on a little bit more to, to restructure this year's contract, but they are not beholden to him. And that's where these short-term contracts – you know, likely what they probably would have done with Keenan Allen or whomever else. That's where that helps because you got two more years of of uh, CJ on his rookie deal. Plus, you know, it might not kick in until after that the three years from now. So really like three years where you can really spend pretty liberally. But ideally what you do is you spend money on veterans on short-term contracts. You draft well. And this, like this trade is compatible with both those goals because you've not given up much at all. You've given up the equivalent of a late second round or an early third round pick to get a guy in and help maximize CJ Stroud's value on his rookie contract. The other thing I'd say is like, without getting into an argument about Josh Allen versus CJ Stroud and all that. um, I think that Stefan Diggs was brought in to help legitimize and improve Josh Allen you're bringing Stefan Diggs in in this situation where Stefan Diggs isn't this, like he's not as potent and as lethal as he was a few years ago, but you're bringing him into a situation where you're not trying to legitimize CJ Stroud. You're trying to help push CJ Stroud over the top and make it that much easier for him after he's already gotten off to a really good start. So I think that's important. Um, there's not like, I honestly, I didn't do a live stream immediately after this trade came down just because I wanted to absorb enough of it and I really needed to find out about the compensation because I had some knee jerk reservations about it. The reservations are really kind of fallen by the wayside. And, 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 and part of it is that you look, you know what, even if it doesn't work out this year, if, if this turns out to be a bad pick, I like if, if the worst case scenario came true, 
they could cut Stefan Diggs. Don't worry, I'm saying worst case scenario. If the absolute worst case scenario in the history of football came to be and somehow it was just a huge mess, they could cut Stefan Diggs in week three and it wouldn't harm them down the road. I mean, obviously, it would have it would turn down. It would harm us. It would harm Nick Casario's reputation, all of that. But it would not harm the Texans' ability to operate as a business moving forward. So that part I'm I'm super stoked about. Super, super, super stoked about. This is the other question. Yeah, Diggs is not required to be the number one here. And yeah, and I think I, I I do think that sometimes I feel like we still get wrapped up in wide receiver one, wide receiver two conversations where there's enough examples and situations where that's not necessarily the case. And and I think that's what it'll be here. I guess that's my only reservation about it right now is is Diggs. You know, Diggs, I think, probably at various times in the last couple of years has thought, my God, could I just, could I get somebody to take some attention off of me? And he probably would have, like, in the moment, it's kind of it's kind of like when you're hungry. How much, you haven't eaten in two days, how much money are you going to pay for a sardine sandwich? Way more than you ever thought you would. So there's times where it's been cold up in Buffalo. They've had to go play at a different location because a snowstorm came through. All of that. And meanwhile, he doesn't have anybody alongside him. In his mind, he's probably like, oh, hell yeah, I'd love to be one of the three in a, in a wide receiver's room. It gets maybe a little bit different on down the line, but I think winning winning cures a lot of that, so I'm not overly worried about it. Yes, yes, no, no, Zach. Case Keenum looks like me. You're so late to this. Just get this straight. I'm the elder in this situation. I do, like, honestly, though, I kind of lucky that I landed in Houston where I look like Case Keenum. I look like Brian Cushing sometimes. Like when I'm about 10 pounds lighter than I am now, I look like Brian Cushing. Um, but it it takes away from looking like Ed Helms. I get more Case Keenum comments than I get Ed Helms. So like, you know, or every now and then a younger person would be like, you look like that guy from that dentist in the office, uh, that dentist in in the, the bachelor party. Oh like, yeah. Or I look like the, the guy on the office. Yeah. No, I look like Case Keenum. So I'm good with that. Oh, wait, where was that one about Diggs' contract? Here we go. Uh, Diggs' contract is team-friendly for his caliber. Texans is, uh, essentially get Diggs on a one-year, $19 million deal with team options every year after that. Diggs, eight, yeah, it, yeah, it kind of acts, yeah, it works out that way. Um, if you're going to like put it in baseball terms, Diggs' 18.5 million cap hit in 2025 ranks 15th among wide receivers. John, I would accuse you of copying and pasting that, but I don't know. Uh, they basically traded down for a chance to take a look at Diggs as a number one wide receiver for at least one year. I do that every year. <laughs> um, then, yeah, I do that every day. Then he also gets an extra fifth and a sixth. Yeah, the, the compensation, I am a hundred percent, a hundred percent cool. I said you look like Case Keenum's mild-mannered brother. We got to find out if Case Keenum does have a brother. I mean, we don't, that's not hard to find out. I personally don't know if Case has a brother. But if he does, does he look like me as well? Houston, we have a radiator flushing problem. And as they mama, there go that man again, only larger than life now. Well put, well put. Uh, Diggs and Dell are about to be a threat down the field. And even if you cover them, there's still Nico Collins and Dalton Schultz. But you got to go look out for mixing on a check down or something. Yeah, it's uh, like there's it's you slice it and dice it for four million different ways and honestly i feel i feel really good at I, I feel really good about it um an hour late but who's counting love that immediate reaction you had this morning seth but i think the upside is uh more than worth risk yeah overall i like i didn't i don't know if you're here or not when i just when i discussed that no my immediate reaction this morning before i knew what the compensation was was that i didn't like it like i i like i do like I've, I've been through this like you know Obviously, you weren't here. Oh, what happened to me? What happened to me? There I am. Um, no, all of my potential objections to it have fallen by the wayside. And that started with the actual draft compensation. Once I found out that they'd given up really just negligible compensation for Stefan Diggs, who I don't even care if he's still in his actual prime yet or not. Um, when you, when you, wherever he is in his life arc, he just got boosted a little bit. He got Ozempic here by getting Tank Dell and Nico Collins as his running mate. So that I'm, listen, man, the initial reaction in my mind was, oh, crap, they gave up like next year's first round pick for Stefan Diggs. Now that that's fallen by the wayside, any other objection I have about it is negligible. 
and I am a okay 100% with this. There's not um, there's not a part of me that thinks that somehow this was a bad idea or anything. I don't know what Landry has done with my initial like three second slivers since then. I'm I'm sure it's been all on the up and up and very reputable of him. But yeah, uh, let's see. I want to make a custom shirt for this free agency. <laughs> Uh, you don't win free agency on day one. Yes, that was my, uh, that's what I said long, long ago. It does, it, uh, it was a long time ago. It feels like when I was trying to stress to people that you don't win free agency on day one. As everybody was wanting to get out the pitchforks for one poor, uh, let's see. I want to see what, I, I did pick this up earlier. I want to play if we still have it. No, oh, we might not have it. Okay, I do want to hear what Landry and John were saying about this in one of their segments because I saw they brought Sean in on it. So I'll play this for a little bit. I always feel a little bit iffy about stealing from my employer by uh, <laughs> by by playing their YouTube as I'm on YouTube. But at least this isn't actually during Landry's show. Hold on a second. So this would have been in the loop. This was still in the infancy of the trade. And I'm not sure that they would have uh, known what the compensation was at this point. So let's see what it is. And now all of a sudden you feel like in a short time, you've gone from football hell to football heaven. Yeah. You move down 19 spots in this draft and basically pick up Stefan Diggs. Mm -hmm. we, we can talk about all the shrapnel of the seventh and the fifth and the sixth. Texans made out huge on those picks too. But at its core, this trade is the Texans getting Stephon Diggs from moving down from 23rd to 42 in the draft, which if you feel like this is a draft mm -hmm. where you can get a player at 42 that you really like, that you like nearly or as much They've as you would have got at 23, right? They've told us. Well, and I think the big thing about this draft, not to get too far off in the draft weeds, yeah. like the this first round of this draft is going to have so many guys taken in it prior to 23 or maybe even mm -hmm. in the first round overall that the Texans, I don't think ever would have been on it in the first place right? because they actually have a roster now that has real offensive linemen and a quarterback mm -hmm. and wide receiver. Well, now another wide receiver to go with it. Um, so I think if you feel that way about the 42nd pick versus the 23rd pick, it's almost like you got Stefan Diggs for free. Yeah. Now the, fl I heard you guys talking about it in your open talking about the EA sports aspect of this trade. <laughs> This this is a trade, and I heard one of you guys say fantasy football. Like this is a trade to me. Like I'm a commissioner of a fantasy league. If there was a fantasy equivalent of this trade that came across my desk and I approved it, yeah. the rest of the league would be livid. They'd, with be, me. they'd be nuts. They'd, they'd be, be nuts. livid. Yeah. Okay. That like that's a good point as far as the actual compensation. And to go back to the DeAndre Hopkins trade, I think that something has shifted and changed in the last couple of years because DeAndre, who at the time was still in his 20s. Like DeAndre was more in his, in his prime uh, than than Stefan Diggs. Um, but was still like that was bad compensation for DeAndre Hopkins. Things changed this year where suddenly you're starting to see guys like Brian Burns get traded for not that much. Um, another couple notable trades this year with with good veteran players getting traded. Oh, um the uh the defensive back Son of a bitch. Now I'm getting tired. Javondre to uh to the uh to the Titans. Like that, like that that compensation was almost nothing. And if it especially if it weren't the um if it weren't the Chiefs doing it, people would have just absolutely lambasted them. You know, even if it were yeah, it, it, certainly if it was the Texans like two years ago or whatever, um, they would have lambasted them for not getting proper compensation. But the this year, I think things have just changed a little bit and teams are starting to get a little bit more savvy about offloading either contracts or what have you. And and really the Bills at this point, heading into the draft, had probably, like those Bills commentators were saying, had probably made the decision that, all right, we got to clear the deck in a lot of ways. It's going to be painful this year, but Diggs, like we're going to have to get rid of Diggs next year, if not this year. And we got a bunch of good wide receivers in this draft. So we'll take one on the chin and we just got to get rid of them. Um, the fact that they were able to do it for what they did, I think probably speaks to just the chilling of the market and teams understanding that, okay, these, deal, these deals do come available if, if you stick around and wait, wait around long enough. I think that this, this, honestly, this might be the year that 
this might be the year that like Nick really comes into his own as a man, as a GM and that he's been at it for a few years. He's always been active at trading on draft day, especially stuff, right? Like he's always had a ton of transactions, but like that Daryl Morey part of him that I think maybe like really is starting to figure out how to be patient because there's something like the James Harden trade available at some point. And you have to, you have to sit through a lot of lulls and you got to not press for things. But if you wait for the right moment, you're going to get something like that. And you know, like the James Harden trade, and I'm not comparing the Stefan Diggs trade to the James Harden trade. Don't get me wrong. But, but that ability to just sit and wait and know that something's going to happen. Um, I talked about this with Sean the other day. It's something you learn like after, after I've like, I've, I've lived in a bunch of different places. We've, they had to move a bunch and I've bought houses a few times. Like you learn after a while, like, Oh, wait a second. I got to stop falling in love with some of these houses that we're looking at because another one always shows up. Like there's never, there's not, I don't know if you know this, there's quite a few houses in the United States. And at some point, even if it's not on the market right now, even if you got to stay in the apartment you're in for a little bit longer, what have you, something else is going to come along. So you don't bend your standards based on whatever the current market is. And I think Nick's really good at that. Like he's got that correct amount of robot to him to where he won't get too emotionally hungry for something or try to stretch too much to make a deal happen. Hopefully, I think maybe this is a little bit of the culmination of that. Like you didn't know, they didn't know how they were going to solve the wide receiver problem. And it, it for a second, it looked like it might be Keenan Allen. Um, it turns out it's Stefan Diggs. And I don't know if they... We'll find out maybe more later about like just how long and how much they've been in discussions with the Bills, but it's not something you can bank on or count on. So that part of it, um, I, I really like about it. All right, it's a bit much. Bill O'Brien tried. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't know if it's about the bit much or B O B tried. Yeah, old B O B should have just sucked to play Colin. So you know what though, honestly. So with Bill O'Brien. Um, with Bill O'Brien, he was the opposite of what I was just talking about, right? Like, and this is where, this is why it's so hard for coaches to be the GM. Ideally, the GM is like the adult and the coach is the star athlete teenager, like the parent and the star athlete teenager. And the star athlete teenager sometimes just needs to understand that you can't have everything all at once. And the parents got to uh, you know, dole things out slowly and be careful and think about your future. And yes, son, you have to go to school. No, I don't. I'm going to be a star. No, you have to go to school and you have to keep a B average. Or you can't. And that's how it's supposed to operate. When you remove that parent from the head coach, all of a sudden the kid is staying up too late. He's eating junk food. He's uh, going out and he's buying those strength shoes that you used to see in Sports Illustrated uh, with his allowance money and everything. And it's a mess. And you end up overspending. And like with O'Brien, it wasn't just the Hopkins trade. It was like so many trades. It was, it was you know, with all due respect to Whitney Merciless, because I love Whitney, but they gave Whitney Merciless a contract that they did not need nor they should have given to Whitney Merciless at that point. They gave the they gave the damn center. Uh, they gave Nick Martin like a top five centers contract, and he was struggling to find a job two years later. It was like deal after deal after deal, trading away Clowney, like all these things that in the moment you can make an excuse for it or you can make an argument for it, but the sum total of it was just devastating. So with Nick, it's been the exact opposite to where, man, all right, I can I can find issues with that and I can find issues with that, but you look at the sum total of everything. And on the balance, it makes sense. You know, this, this trade, especially, even if it doesn't work out, like this is the classic situation where if the Stefan Driggs trade doesn't work out, I will not say that the, it was a bad attempt at a trade because it's obvious that the Texans went into it with eyes wide open and they went into it with protections. They're getting a veteran, a veteran wide receiver who can be a bit mercurial at times, but they understand he's 30. He'll turn 31 in late November this year. Um, but I don't worry about the physical, uh, the physical decline just yet because he's, he's going to be in a better situation this year than he was last year. So whatever physical decline there might be, um, it's going to be offset by the fact that he's got actual running mates this year. 
And, uh, you know, had a good quarterback last year, but no running backs this year, no running mates this year. He's got running mates. So I feel better about that. But if it doesn't work out, even if it's an abject disaster and they have to get rid of Stefan Diggs somehow, the downside is minimal. They didn't give up hardly anything in draft compensation and the salary only really hurts you this year. So like this was a, this was, this was some professional general managing. This was just a, okay. So let's take uh you know what? Okay, let's see. Uh, I genuinely think former players have the best outlook on things. Y'all are much more insightful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Magic. I, I will say, uh, I'm, I'm much dumber about some things, though, than my my fellow professionals, my, my fellow sports radio people. Like, way dumber about some things. I think one thing that I saw in this article about Ryan Poles, because Ryan Poles does like a national media outlet article about once every three days, he mentioned that his college teammate, Matt Ryan, had told him, had given him advice when he took the job. And he said that it, the locker room always knows. Like, when you're a GM, you better, you better own your mistakes and take care of them really quickly. Because, the, like, the players know who's being kept around just because he was a draft pick, who was a bad free agency signing, all these things. And sometimes these guys linger on and on and on on a team forever because – because the GM's pride is too wrapped up in it. I think that Casario so far, and I, and I think I, I, early on, I know a lot of people thought he had a huge ego. I thought the exact opposite. I never really understood why people thought he had a huge ego. Um, unless maybe it was just kind of like, maybe when he was first getting comfortable being in the media all the time, maybe his, his personality didn't come out as much. But um, I think he's very willing to understand and accept that he's made mistakes. He's done that multiple times in that first year. Uh, the defensive lineman there that they traded for and then got rid of immediately. Uh, you know, like they, they admitted their mistakes on that one. So I feel, uh, I feel good about it. Let's see. <laughs> Seth is, you are dumber than so am I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Seth is, you are dumber than make. <laughs> I'm laughing at that. So yeah, I obviously I'm dumb. All right. Let me get back to this. I want to get back to our friends on in the loop. Cause I saw Landry make a good point earlier and I want to be sure I acknowledge him. I want to acknowledge him. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Vivid with me. Yeah. So this is a great day, man. This is a really good day to be a Texans fan. I think it's further validation of where they're headed to, if not at already, in terms of just the tier that they're on. Yeah. And it's made 2024 uh, even more fun than it's already going to be. I always check myself when I go one extreme or the other, like like really, really adamant, strong feelings uh, about something that is happening as it breaks. So tell me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I just texted the family text because they're obviously huge Texans fans too. I said the Texans are Super Bowl contenders as of 10 minutes ago. Mm. Yay or nay? Yeah. I, uh, oh, wait. that's the thing they needed most. And th this is like, it's kind of my adjustment because you're used to trades. They still got a full draft, man. Like, like yeah. normally, like when, yeah, that's a, and honestly, that's a, that's a really good point. And that I have to keep reminding myself that they still, they still have everything. Like they didn't lose anything off of this. I, I'm going to give it a full night of sleep and uh contemplation i'm gonna pray to different gods and different religions and i just want to wake up in the morning and be absolutely sure about it i'll probably look to vegas for a little bit of confirmation but it's hard not to look at what they've done in free agency and then when you look at this this key maybe keystone move to make the team better is that it's it's certainly 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 not a joke to talk about the Texans Super Bowl odds whatsoever. And I think what you have to look at, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna make a counter argument to it, if I'm gonna argue with myself, if Seth were to say, all right, they're a Super Bowl contender now, um, evil Seth on my shoulder might say, Well, do you realize you realize you do realize you don't have a starting cornerback opposite of Derek Stingley? And Derek Stingley only played half the snaps in the season last year. And I would say, well, that's a good point. But as far as I know, I've got no reason to believe that Derek Singley is injured now or is at any greater injury risk now moving on to the future, except for prior circumstances. But I also feel like because they bolstered the pass rush, um, the combination of Danico Autry, Daniil Hunter, 
and imp- a still improving Will Anderson. Remember, you have to factor that in. Like I, like Will Anderson, it's a, like Will Anderson should be in double digit sacks somewhat routinely. I think he made enough improvement in the second half of the season and with an entire off season uh, in the NFL. I think you should you should expect that he starts being a double digit sack guy. That makes everybody behind them better. So a defense that had already come a long way last year during the season, I think through experience and through the draft and through perhaps another free agency pickup or so and the previous free agency pickups, they're going to be a better than average defense. I don't know how much better than average, but they'll be an above average defense. And and with a, a quarterback, as long as CJ makes that Joe Burrow bump into his second year, very, very possible. Um, and remember when... When the Bengals made the Super Bowl, they were like one of the dead last, like bottom three in terms of odds at the beginning of the season. Texans already were much higher than that, but this does uh, this this changes things. This changes things quite substantially. A little bit more of in the loop and how they were responding to it. This was after they understood what the draft compensation was, so uh, they 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 were able to absorb everything in full and total. When you make a move like this, it's like, okay, well, we traded our first, we traded our second, or what? They got a full draft. Mm-hmm. That's weird. <laughs> I mean, it's good, weird, but that's weird. Isn't it weird to you? Like, yes. I mean, is is that not strange? And you can pick from the, and, and like I said, this, I, I, I'm going to be variations of this theme all day long. I've been in this game a long time, not to be that guy. Oh, look at you. No, this was brilliance on display from mm-hmm. Nick Casario. Yeah. Just absolute, from, from the very first day, you know, when we were, you know, talking about what they didn't do to the second day to what they did do, every step he knew where the chess pieces were going to be next. And and then that to me was is something you just don't see. He knew the teams that were desperate. Mm-hmm. I think that's the big thing. I think you look at the, the you look at the chain of events of these yeah. two trades. That's where I don't he knew that Yeah, like I don't know. I, I think as far as knowing exactly where all the trade pieces or where all the, the chess pieces were, I'm not I'm not sure I a hundred percent agree with that. Um I think that I think that with Nick, it is very much about the fluidity of the situation. And like whenever we've talked to him, he very much stresses that like it it's hazardous to plan too far out ahead because so many things change day by day, hour by hour in the NFL that you just have to be open to many, many different possibilities, which is a stressful place to be for a lot of us. I'm not, I'm not one that thrives on ambiguity. I get very stressed out and nervous. I would be, uh, I would be a horrendous. I'd be like three times worse than Bill O'Brien as a general manager. Okay. Well, that's, that's maybe not, that's maybe putting it a little too extreme, but um, I do think that he, he understood that he didn't have to chase opportunities. You know, they could have upped their offer above and beyond what, even further above and beyond what Chicago offered for Keenan Allen. Maybe to just, if he felt like, oh no, we've got to get Keenan Allen. But like he passed on Keenan Allen and I don't know if at that moment he thought it was realistic to get Stefan Diggs for what amounted to a late second round pick or an early third round pick. I just, I don't know if he knew that. Um, or if he, if he, if he planned on that, but he knew that a situation like that might arise or it might. And I think they would have like, I, it's not like I was going to panic if they hadn't gotten a third wide receiver. I I had started off even skeptical that they should even go after one. I got changed. Like, actually, a lot of listeners and viewers changed me around on that. And I changed my opinion on that. But it still wasn't something I was going to be distraught over, partly because there's so many good wide receivers, or at least good wide receiver prospects in this draft. Um and I think that's where Nick was too. And ideally, you want to go into the draft or free agency without feeling overly desperate to get anybody and and to take the deals that arise as they come. And I think that's what we ended up getting in in this trade right here. And it would have been the same thing with the Keenan Allen trade. I don't know if they knew exactly that, that Keenan Allen was going to be available, but he knew that guys like Keenan Allen would come available. And the teams more so now than ever, you're just, they're using trades and they're willing to walk away. It looks like they're willing to walk away from deals a little bit more quickly. Maybe, you know, part of it too is just the cap rising by as much as it did this year. That gives a lot of teams extra wiggle room and eating dead space. And the the bills, you know, that the cap going up by as much as it did is one of the things that allows the bills to walk away from Stefan Diggs right now and to be able to absorb that 30 million dead dead cap hit. I mean, that's the the amount that the cap went up is exactly the amount that the the bills needed to absorb this space. So that's that made things a little bit different, different too. 
Uh, let's see. Even if Diggs is a cancer, he's an outsider in the beginning. How much damage could he even do in that locker room in the first season? Right. And and one thing I said earlier, and I'm going to double check this with some Buffalo people, but I think there's a difference sometimes between a malcontent and a cancer. So, which is like, yeah, it's frankly, it's like the difference between a mole and a cancerous tumor. A mole might be ugly to look at, but it's not spreading around and causing damage elsewhere. And I think some of the things that Stefan Diggs and the way he would act out at times, you, you could look at that as kind of like a mole uh, on his reputation. But a cancer is something, a cancer in a locker room is a guy that spreads to others. You know, it's an infectious disease. I've never gotten the sense that Stefan Diggs was a guy who was like fomenting uh, dissent or, you know, creating a bad locker room environment or anything. I think he's, I think he's a guy that just acts out sometimes and people know it and realize it and they just go on about their day. I could be wrong on that, uh, but uh, I think I saw a Doctor Who reference here. He's living in a tesseract, seeing through time and getting these awesome trades and drafts. Yeah. I hope everyone stays healthy for this upcoming season. That would help too. Um, I wanted T. Higgins, Josh Cooper says. Yeah, no, yeah, okay. So, you know, that's another one. All right, well, T. Higgins... I don't know. I, I think there's another one that maybe was a possibility, but I think the Bengals are in a, they're kind of sitting in a nice spot right now where there's not a huge hurry to get a T Higgins deal done. And he is young and he's the kind of guy that you want to hang on to as opposed to a guy like Stefan Diggs. The, the Bills knew that they were going to have to get rid of him within a couple years at the latest. So I would have, yeah, a young T Higgins that you knew you could have for however long that would have been nice. But I, again, talking about the different situations that it might arise, this is the one that was most palatable, palatable right now. Uh, Daniil Hunter will keep his old teammate in check if Dick starts acting up. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Y'all, one year run is over. Oh, Mac. I'll never get over. I'll never get over that, that vicious put down. Yeah. Uh, they traded for Diggs because of the contract. Yes. Barely getting started. Ulos. I don't know what that means. You can pay Nico after digs. <laughs> Imagine being compared to a mole and that being the positive of two choice. Hey, 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 look, I, I come up with these things on the fly, Daniel. It's not, it's, it's, I didn't compare him to a mole. I compared his emotional outbursts to a mole. Like, you know, it was like the emotional out. If, if Drew Brees had an emotional outburst instead of a mole on his face, that's what it would be. I wasn't comparing Stefan Diggs himself to a mole. I knew that's where the analogy broke down because then I, I went to the cancer side of things. Yeah. Diggs doesn't have to play in the cold. You know what? <clears throat> Might have been as simple as that. Plus, what Diggs... Oh, boy. This is going to be one of those moments where I cannot remember if it was three years ago or 27 years ago that the Vikings played that one season outside. But I can't remember if, obviously it wasn't 27 years ago, but I can't remember if Stefan Diggs was on the Minnesota team that would have played outside while they were waiting for their um, waiting for their stadium to be finished. I think he's just eccentric, maybe like DeAndre Hopkins or Terrell Owens. You can live with that. A wide receiver usually has, wide receiver room usually has one diva on good teams. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think I'm 100% on board with that. And like I talked about earlier, like a front runner – is only an issue if you're not out in front. And that's when it gets ugly. And then it only becomes a really ugly issue if you're not out in front and you've got a front runner on the team and you've got him on like a five-year contract with $150 million guaranteed. The Texans don't have any of that in Stefan Diggs right now. They basically have him on a one-year deal with, as, as one of you earlier said, it's basically like having a bunch of options on him because the guarantees really are only for this one year. So um, I'm, I'm good with that. Oh, he was a cancer in Minnesota. No, no, no. He was a pain in the ass, which is different. Plus, he was like, uh, Mac, I don't know if you pay attention to the NFL. He was Josh Allen's best bud for those first couple of years. And everything was awesome. Like, there could never be a problem between those two. Except then the Bills started, like, doing things like not having any other wide receivers to compliment him. Um they just flat out, they they did not have the right offensive coordinator in place. So I got to, uh, Mac, I hate to do this, but I think, I feel like it's it's not going to bother you. I'm just going to go ahead. And, no, I won't, I won't put you in timeout. Uh, so far, you've annoyed me a little bit and you've looked a little bit like a troll, but so far you're not a cancerous troll. Does that make sense? 
Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I performed a biopsy, uh, but I'm not going to go in and perform surgery just yet. 2024 should be fun. So you feel like Howard's contract being reconstructed was for this because they also re-signed, uh, uh, oh, Neville. And I can't recall the other one right now. Um, yeah, I think either this, this was either in the works or maybe just because they had a few of these in the fire and they were potentially going for it. Um, I think that it was probably, we'll find out maybe whether it was specifically for this deal or if it was just that they wanted to make a move like this. And, uh, and, and this ended up being the one. Let's see. The whole team is bought into the D'Amico mentality. If a player doesn't want part of it, he won't be a cancer. He will just get shipped out. Diggs can either fall in line and be successful here or not. Yeah, that's where it's just um, – that's where it's just – it's a one-year – it's basically – it's a one-year commitment. And that's why I'm just I'm, – I'm not worried about it. Not worried about it at all. Hello from Sweden. What time is it in Sweden right now, Casper? MD Anderson, Dr. Seth Payne. Uh, yeah, we read that one, right? Yeah. Uh, your reaction on air made my day today. I know, Blake, but was that, wait, was that you earlier that mentioned that I was, I didn't approve of the trade? Um, it was, I didn't approve of the trade until I found out what the compensation was. And then after I sat back and reflected, I was gung ho on this damn trade. Uh, wouldn't surprise me to see Woods cut to save another 5 million. He's a mole troll. Uh, let's see. How much is he being paid and how does it work out with the team paying with the teams paying Diggs? Uh Diggs it's a, it basically ends up being a 19 million dollar deal this year. Um there's like most of it, and all of the guarantees are this year except for like 3 million dollars in ensuing years. Somebody correct me on that number if um and it's 10:06 p.m. in Sweden. Okay. That's good. That's good. Uh, who would not want to play for D'Amico? Right, right, right. Can we get Casario 30 for 30, 60 minutes, or maybe call Netflix for a limited series? You know what I do want to do? Since I got on here, I've been on here forever. I want to get through and just kind of clean up on some of the details of the trade. And I apologize to you guys because I'm just going to go ahead and uh, like basically be a narrator on an ESPN article. But I've got too many tabs open because I've got... I'm very overwhelmed with all this stuff. If I can just make it through this without closing out my StreamYard tab, we're going to be awesome. It'll be the best thing that ever happened. Let's see. Bill's trade star wide receiver to the Texans for a 2025 pick. The Bills traded four-time Pro Bowl wide receiver Stefan Diggs to the Houston Texans for draft pick compensation on Wednesday. The Bills received a 2025 second-round pick via the Vikings. It's the Vikings pick, remember, that they just got from that trade. Uh, in exchange for Diggs, a 2024 sixth-round pick. Very important to remember that Stefan Diggs was a sixth-round pick. That is the... It just put that in your uh, put that in your holster to use, like when you might otherwise say, "Well, you know, Arian Foster was an undrafted rookie free agent." I can't think of another sixth round pick that you might use to show that sixth round picks were good. <laughs> Certainly not a Hall of Fame quarterback. Um, and a 2025 fifth round pick. Let's see. Oh, so they in exchange for a 2024 sixth round pick and a 2025 fifth round pick. That's what the Texans get back. Uh, the Texans acquired that pick from the Vikings when they traded their 2024 first round pick to Minnesota. The trade comes. This is uh, this is one of the microaggressions that I referenced earlier. Tim Graham, who writes for The Athletic up in Buffalo, somebody had asked him, like, okay, what was the final straw in the Bills finally getting sick of Stefan Diggs and saying sayonara, aside from their cap issues that they're going to have to address? And it was, Tim said, a thousand microaggressions. And it's really been a lot like that. I, I know one big moment for Bills fans was after the loss to the Chiefs in the playoff, playoffs, Stephon Diggs had a really bad dropped ball in that game on a deep ball. And it was a well-thrown ball. Stephon Diggs totally should have caught it. He turned around as he was walking back towards the huddle, and he did this little thing, like as if – the way people interpreted it was him saying that, oh, the, the pass was just a little bit off. <laughs> and I, okay, all right. I mean, it was, I, you know what? I'll show the video. Uh, uh, I don't want to rain on a parade. It's one of these little things that we're going to have to deal with um, that's somewhat questionable. But 
it, that that was kind of like the final straw on a lot of Bills fans emotionally, I think. But the trade comes a day after Diggs responded, you sure? To a social media user's declaration that he wasn't essential to Bills quarterback Josh Allen's success. Um, yeah, I, I, I can understand that. I get that. Somebody is trying to say, like, you're not essential to his success. Well, now we'll find out just how essential he was to the success. I do think that um, I, I don't worry about Stefan Diggs production in the second half of this season where, you know, he, he went multiple games without getting more than three or four receptions in a game. A lot of that is just the fact that the Bills were so bereft of receiving weapons. Um, you know, like Gabe Davis certainly wasn't the awesome number two that they hoped he would be, that Stephon Diggs got a lot of attention. And I, I think that'll change. I don't know what his total numbers will look like this year. There's three really good wide receivers, starting caliber wide receivers that they're going to have to spread the ball around to. So if there's disgruntlement, at least it should come with the offense having success as well. The Texans traded for running back Joe Mixon last month, acquiring him from the Bengals, and then signed him to a three-year $27 million extension. They also made a splash on Daniil Hunter, two-year $49 million contract, 48 of which was guaranteed, remember? That was a that was a big splash that I think because it was a two-year deal. Again, we've got this theme of if you're gonna sign a guy who's in his 30s or old in his 30s, then sign him to a it can be lucrative, but be sure it's a one or a two-year deal. We don't want to be beholden to these guys who are in their 30s forever. So, uh, you know, um, that part of it, kind of the commitment the Texans have, the total guarantees they have to Stefan Diggs are not bad at all uh, extending beyond this year for a guy who turns 31 in late November this year. Last month, the Texans tried to trade for Keenan Allen and offered a day two pick from the 2025 draft. The Chargers instead sent Allen to the Bears, but it was a sign the Texans were eager to improve their receiver core to help Stroud in his second season. The Bills, meanwhile, had moved on from several veterans this season. Tredavious White, Jordan Poyer, Mitch Morris, uh, Gabe Davis signed with the Jaguars, Leonard Floyd signed, Floyd signed with the 49ers. Last season, Diggs had repeatedly publicly expressed a commitment to the Bills and a desire to retire with the team. The three-time captain, D'Amico loves his captains, uh, signed a four-year, $104 million contract extension in April of 2022. So it lasted two years. Like that, <laughs> that huge extension. This is, the, this is the money part about the money. The Bills are going to carry a dead money charge of $31 million next season after trading him. This will be the highest known dead money charge ever for a wide receiver in any season, according to ESPN stats and info. Some of the drama from last year. Last year, he was excused from the first day of the team's mandatory minicamp by Sean McDermott, who said that he thought the matter with his star receiver was resolved. That clarification came a day later after he said he was very concerned about Diggs' absence. Remember, remember that whole weird thing where basically uh, Sean McDermott said that he was concerned, but then claimed that there was nothing to be concerned about, and then said the media was just making stuff up. There's just always been a a lot of a lot of drama. Um, this is something that <laughs> this is what Diggs spoke during the season. Chaos created around me. Let's see. I've never really said anything about being unhappy or any instance of that. So when you're drawing conclusions as to stuff I've never said, that's what kind of troubles me because it kind of throws a wrench in it. It kind of creates chaos where I haven't created. Chaos created around me, whereas I just been in the same space. I've been in the same place and I've spoken true words. I've said that same thing over and over and over. So when you draw a conclusion as to how I feel in my foreseeable future here, I've never said anything. But I was a Buffalo Bill. I gave it everything I got. I'm professional. I'm a professional, and I treat this game as such. So that was during the season. At the time, Diggs was distancing himself from tweets that his brother, uh, cornerback Trayvon Diggs, wrote, including, man, 14 got to get up out of there. So there's that. And then his, his production decreased following the first six games of the season. It was a dramatic year there up in Buffalo. And look, it's I think it's important to note that not all the drama was created by not all the drama was created by by Stefan Diggs. There was a whole lot of Sean McDermott and otherwise, not to mention you fired your offensive uh your, your offensive coordinator midway through the season. I'm gonna call it a day for now. Uh if any more details of this emerge, I will be on it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I know at one point we had like 500 people on here, uh, which is which is a lot for a, a mid-afternoon stream on a Tuesday. 
or Wednesday. What's today? Wednesday. Okay, so the Astros after tonight will be uh, two and five, correct? If they win tonight, they'll be two and five, which is the same record they had after the first seven games of 2019. All right, we've got. I'm going to focus on the positive for a moment here because I spent four hours this morning ranting about base running errors. Uh, before all of a sudden, the last minute of my four-hour show, I found out that the Texans had traded for Stefan Diggs. But Jeremy Pena, uh, if he finished the season with the numbers he has right now, he would be the best player in the history of baseball. There will probably be a little bit of a regression, but he's looking good so far. Uh, Yiner Diaz, likewise, he's freaking Johnny Bench. And uh, Jordan, though his conventional numbers don't look good, is hitting the ball hard as hell. His expected stats are all very, very good right now. He'll come around. Uh, it's just, it's these damn relievers. Um, the starters are pitching magnificently. I, I, I'm, I'm talking myself into this. Same way it took me all of like 37 minutes to talk myself into the Stefan Diggs trade. Uh, it's taken me, it's going to take me about seven games to talk myself into the Astros being just fine. I've stopped being, I've stopped being somebody who like needs to be, oh, it's 162 games. It's a long season. There's no guarantee I'm going to be alive at, at game 162. I need my sugar and I want my sugar now, damn it. Everybody have a great one. Oh, like and subscribe, please. And tell a friend. Say, you guys just, so you should go follow the Seth Payne show on YouTube. Just astoundingly good content. Astound and the best, the best viewers, the best comments, except for that one guy that I almost blocked. But it looked like he came back into the line. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a victory. Good day, everybody, and enjoy the afterglow of this magnificent trade.